Good morning. Welcome. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Palm Harbor Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are continuing in our series on our deep dive into the book of Revelation chapter 14. So far we have amassed a study on the first six verses and we finally graduated to verse number seven today. Wow, I know we got our angel wings over here in terms of we are finally made it to the first angel's message. The first six verses was just the pretext of what was going on. So now, without further ado, let us go into the message today. And I want to begin by opening up with a call to worship from Steps to Christ, page 90, paragraph 1. And she says, there is nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the study of the scriptures. When we look in neuroscience, things that actually enhance neural cognitive function, we find that playing or learning a new instrument strengthens the intellect, that memorizing or reciting information strengthens the intellect, and then the other thing they found that strengthened the intellect was Bible study. And this was proven using PET scans, looking at areas of the brain that activated while reading the Bible. And so the word is a living word, and it has power in itself to heal or strengthen the intellect. And she goes on, she goes, No other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts, to give vigor to the faculties, as the broad, ennobling truths of the Bible. If God's word were studied as it should be, men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character, and a stability of purpose rarely seen in these times. There was one quote I found where she said, no matter what detriment the mind has suffered, there is strength in the mind given to understanding scripture. She says, no matter what's happened to you, she says, God will bless your mind to understand what you read in his word. That nobody has an excuse saying, I'm too dumb or too enabled to read the Bible. She says, God will bless every soul that picks up the Bible and reads it, no matter what's happened to you. Okay, so let's look. So as a recap, we've, we went through verse 6 over the last two presentations where it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. And we read or learned that these angels flying in the midst of heaven represent God's people giving the message. And they're represented symbolically as being in heaven because they are the saints. They are those who are in God's church who are giving this message. And it says, And they having the everlasting gospel. We learn that this gospel is not just the gospel pertaining to the cross, but it is the gospel as it pertains to the sanctuary and the end of the world that it has a specific and certain work it, where we are told to give the trumpet a certain sound. And it says, and it says, they, those flying in the midst of heaven, God's people are taking this gospel and preaching to them that dwell on the earth to every kindred, tongue, nation, and people. So we have a target audience for, the, for this specific gospel. And we did not cover this, but we did cover it in one of my sermons a year or two ago, talking about them that dwell on the earth. It is a term or phrasing used to describe people who are not saved. Those that live on the earth are considered those who are lost or who have not heard the gospel. God's people are always saying, having the mind and character of heaven, that their, where their treasures are, there their hearts will be also, that they are considered as being heavenly citizens even though they are sojourning through this earth. But the wicked who reject God are called dwellers of this earth, whose prince and lord is the power of darkness, who reigns over them. So we know that direction. So let's move into our new verse, verse 7 today, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Simple sentence, but there's a lot there. And so we're going to slowly go piece by piece looking at this passage in great detail so that we understand it. Some key concepts, especially when studying prophecy, and namely here in Revelation chapter 14, we want to take into consideration the timing, the location, and the theology that's being taught in every verse. Timing of the prophecy. So when does it take place, or when did it begin to be correctly understood? As we know, for example, the books of Daniel and Revelation were sealed from the time that they were given, and people throughout these 
the sealed period could not understand it. They could read it, but they didn't have the bearing of what it meant. Um, so even if the prophecy doesn't have a numerical value, like 2,300 years, for example, Revelation 14 does not list a number, but it gives a message, and we know it took place during a certain time that evoked a response on the earth. And so it's important to understand the timing when things took place and how it affects us. Number two is the location of Jesus when that message went forward. Whether he was in the courtyard, like example, he was on the earth preaching and teaching with his disciples, or if he was in the first compartment of the sanctuary during like the Dark Ages, or if he moved into the most holy place of the sanctuary after 1844, because the message and what was being taught changes based off the light revealed from that compartment of the sanctuary. And that's important. And lastly, understanding the theology of what's actually being taught by said prophecy. Every prophecy has a message as well as a time component, and it's important to understand both aspects. And so that's what we're going to do now that we're getting into the three angels' messages is understanding the timing event of each message, because each one had an era when it came to fruition, the location of Jesus when that message was being given, because that allows us to interpret it in the correct light, and then lastly, what was the message itself and what it was supposed to do in those who received it. So, the first part of the first angel um, is actually to fear God. And I know as a young man, especially in middle school, high school, when I started studying, you, the, the knee-jerk, childish response of fear of the Lord is, is to be afraid of something. You have a fear of spiders, a fear of heights, right? And so, that's the cowering, afraid, quivering in your boots kind of fear. However, this is not the fear of the Lord that the Bible is implying us to have. And so we can use the scripture to interpret itself. The Bible is its own expositor. And so we look back and we go to the book of Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In verse, uh, chapter 9 and verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So we're beginning to see a three-dimensional understanding of what the fear of the Lord is. It involves the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, the understanding of holy things, and to hate that which is evil. And this is the first call to worship given in the first angel's message. And the context is these people are these Protestants who came out of the Catholic Church who had to shake off all of the wrong doctrines that had so polluted their minds. It was a re-education of what is true, and they had to have this beginning of knowledge. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14, says, Let us hear the whole conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring every work into judgment. Notice here the fear of the Lord is tied to the judgment. And in Revelation 14, verse 7, it says, Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. So this understanding and knowledge of God should be tied to the work of judgment in the sanctuary. That was the first lesson they needed to understand in the first angel's message. Whether every, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The secret thing is quite an interesting thing to study in the spirit of prophecy. If you look up um, some of these parsings of the words, in Great Controversy, page 482, paragraph 1, we are told, Every man's work passes in review before God and is registered for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness. Every wrong word, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty, every secret sin, with every artful dissembling. Heaven-sent warnings are reproofs neglected, wasted moments, unimproved opportunities, the influence exerted for good or for evil, with its far-reaching results, are all chronicled by the recording angel. It's quite the medical records room, isn't it? In, in medicine, we have to keep records. I don't know if it's like three or five years for insurance purposes or seven years. In <laughs> they've had to keep records on everything for the last 6,000 some years. It's quite interesting. She goes on, uh, Signs of the Times, July 31st, 1901. God's law reaches the feelings and the motives as well as the outward acts. It reveals the secrets of the heart, flashing light upon things before buried in darkness. 
God knows every thought, every purpose, every plan, every motive. The, book of the books of heaven rec record the sins that would have been committed had there been opportunity. That's, that's a big one. The books of heaven record every sin that would have been committed had the opportunity presented itself. And this goes into where it says in Ecclesiastes 12, it says that it records everything, even the secret act. So not only is it physically like doing something in a dark room, but the secret act also is a reference to the, the secrets of the mind. What you're, what you're thinking sitting there right now. Right? The things you would sit at home, you know, you're sitting at home and you have, have your Bible on your lap and you're doing your little study, then your mind starts to wander and it gets into the, you know, the temptation comes and you dwell on that temptation and it turns into lust and that lust conceived is sin. James chapter 1. And so he's saying even the things you don't act on, but you're sitting in your head, sitting there imagining yourself physically doing, it's as if you would have done it if the opportunity would have been made easy for you to do. And it says the, rec the angels even record those thoughts that you have because you're dwelling on sinfulness. Those are the secret acts uh, that Ecclesiastes talks about. God will bring every work into judgment. With every secret thing, by his law, he measures the character of every man. And I love this depiction. As the artist transfers to the canvas the features of the face, so the features of each individual's character are transferred to the books of heaven. God has a perfect photograph of every man's character, and this photograph he compares with his law. We hear about the laws as a written expression of God's character or a mirror of who God is. And then he looks at us in the mirror image of our own character and compares them, right? Because the law is what shows us our sin. It is the schoolmaster. He reveals to man the defects that mar his life and calls upon him to repent and to turn from sin. So no, notice, though, God doesn't leave you with that like pit of despair. He says, acknowledge these things in the fear of the Lord and repent and turn from your sin. So he gives hope. He doesn't just beat you down. He does give hope. So you have to be encouraged, and we're going to keep going as we look at this. When we look at the fear of God, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So the fear of the Lord evokes a call to action to perfect our natures into holiness, that it would draw up the conviction of of the fear of the Lord in, in that believer. And Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. So is that the mindset he wants us to stay in? It's not. Rather, he says, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A sound mind is a mind that cannot be shaken. Somebody who's carrying a lot of guilt from the sin that they're hiding, they generally don't have a sound mind. They're easily shaken. They're, they're, they're a, we call like a, a straw house or a, a glass house because some, they're easily untaken. They're easily unsettled. And so he's saying this call to conviction of sin is what takes that fear and turns you into a sound mind, that you, you're being called to do the right thing. In Psalms 34 and verse 7, it says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivers them. So the fear of the Lord is the first call to action that allows God to send an angel to come and uh, protect you, that you would be moved with holy fear. We're going to look at this um, in the gospel. This is a very powerful story in the gospel, and the context is the crucifixion. And we think about this story in Luke 23 and verses 36 to 40 where Jesus was hanging on the cross and they were making fun of him and the, the two thieves were on his left and on his right. And one of the thieves, the malefactors which hanged, railed on him saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. In verse 40, But the other thief on the cross answered, rebuked him saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? In other words, the one thief says to the other thief who is making fun of Jesus, he goes, are you not convicted, seeing that you are about to die and that you are going to lose out on eternal life, lest ye repent? 
So you have the two, op the two opposing thieves here. One who's mocking Jesus, denying the conviction that's on his heart, and the other one, he's saying, do you not feel the conviction that I feel that you're about to die and this is your last chance to repent? And he's saying, do you not fear God, seeing that you are in the same condemnation? So the fear of the Lord draws from the realization of the condemnation that you're in when you are unforgiven, when you, are unforgiven, when you have not repented of your sin. And that's the first part of that message was you have to take that sinner and draw them to the conviction of sin in their lives. And that's the first component of the first angel's message is to convict people of sin. Because if they don't think they need a savior, they'll never ask for repentance. And God says he cannot help those who do not believe. Another example of this is Paul repeats this concept in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. He goes on from verse 11 to verse 17, talking about the behavior of someone who is unrighteous, that their thoughts are unprofitable, that they do no good, that their throat is an open, open sepulcher, which means they speak evil things, their tongues, they do lie in deceit with poison asps under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to kill and hurt others, and destruction and misery are in all their ways. And he says, they have not known peace. They do not have a sound mind. But in verse 18, he, he says, why are they acting this way? He says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. They have not accepted the first angel's message to fear God and give glory to him. The hope, though, so he goes on in Romans 3, and he says those who believe by the blood of Jesus Christ have a propitiation, an atonement for sin. Again, he doesn't leave them beaten down. He shows them the promise of the Savior that can help, that can save them. And he, he's pointing out the contrast in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. So how do people come to this fear of the Lord? Because God is long-suffering and gracious and good, it says the goodness of God leadeth men to repentance. That's an important lesson to learn. It's the goodness of God that leadeth men to repentance. That shows them to fear God out of the reverence that he deserves. In John, we see this illustration in John chapter 8, verses 7 and 9. Mary's being caught in adultery here. She was set up. But every secret act, Mary thought on these things, and when the opportunity presented itself, she fell into the adultery. And it says, the men brought her before Jesus, and they said, what are you going to do with this woman? And Jesus sees the crowd of men around him. And so when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again, Jesus stooped down and wrote their sins on the ground, and which they had heard, which, of which they had heard it. And being convicted, they felt the fear of God by their own consciousness, and they went out away from the presence of God one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone standing with Mary. So he showed them their sin, and what was the response in their heart? They felt convicted. So this conviction has something to do with the fear of God. In Exodus chapter 20, when Moses came off of the mount in verse 18, it says, And the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off out of fear. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear it, but let not God, let not God speak to us, lest we die. So this is the wrong kind of fear. This is the fear of spiders. But notice what Moses' response was. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. That you would be convicted and that you would stop in your sinful behavior. It's interesting. It's the opposite from what the devil wants the world to fear God for. So let's move on. So if we know the fear of the Lord means to be convicted of your sins, the next parsing of the angel's message says, and give glory to him. So something that deals with this conviction should evoke a behavior that causes you to glorify God. 
So the question is, what is that behavior and how do we then therefore glorify God? In Joshua chapter 7, verse 19, it says, And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto him. What was the act that was glorifying God on Achan's part? He was told by Joshua to confess his sins. And the response is, God be glorified. In Revelation 16, we see the inverse of this behavior. In verse 8 and 9, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over the plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Interesting. They refused to repent because they did not want to glorify God. That repentance itself, is, as in the story of Achan, is what is the thing that gives God the glory. And it is the natural progression of conviction to then draw a confession up out of your lips to God. So it's not enough to just be convicted. There's a lot of people who go around like Eeyore's who are convicted of sin, but then the devil puts them in a pity house and they never go and actually confess. Right? There's a lot of people who live in that halfway of spiritual purgatory where they never actually confess their sin and they still live with it on their shoulders. So that's also not correct. You got to keep going in the completeness of the message. In Matthew, and this is beautiful here. So in Matthew chapter 3, this is the story of John the Baptist. And in those days, John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice, when we give the first angel's message, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, is very similar to John the Baptist's message, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, when Jesus came to this earth, Ju Israel, Ju uh, Jerusalem was in a, this form of judgment that if they rejected him, their probation would be closed as a people. And so John was the one that prepared ye the way of the Lord. Notice down in verse 5, And they went out of, to him in Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region around about in Jordan, and they were baptized of him in Jordan. What was the result of their repentance? They were, bapti they were baptized and they confessed their sins. They had the conviction, they repented, they were baptized, and they confessed their sins from hearing the message. Following in a few verses, in verse 13, And then came Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of himself. So now Jesus has to be baptized, not because of his sinfulness, but as an example. And that he was beginning to enter into his priestly ministry at the age of 30 and he had to be anointed. And so this was John who was called to do this service. And notice what it says. But John forbade Jesus, saying, I have need to be baptized of these. Why do you come to me? John's like, I'm the sinner. <laughs> why, are you, why are you coming to me? Don't I not need to be baptized by you? And Jesus said unto him, Suffer it be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And so Jesus had to fulfill this component of the sanctuary to be baptized, to be the priest, for the priesthood. Then he suffered him. He said, he put it back on John. So you're going to baptize me or not? And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And do you think that glorified the Father when he saw Jesus get baptized? How, 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 you can imagine how his father felt. If you've ever had a kid or a loved one get baptized, the, the sense of feeling that you feel inside of you. Notice Ellen White comments on this passage of Jesus' baptism. She gives us an insight of what was going on internally. She says, The soul of Christ was burdened with the sense of the sinfulness of man and the hardness of their hearts that kept them in unbelief and darkness. But so few would discern his glorious mission and accept the salvation he came from heaven to bring them. 
Christ was about to enter upon a scene of fearful trial and temptation. He was going to begin his public ministry at this point forward, which was to open his life to conflict and suffering. He was to perform new and arduous duties and bear heavy burdens. Such had never been fallen to the lot of any man. His sinless humanity prayed for the support and strength from his father as he was about to commence his labors. He asks for the witness that God accepts fallen man in his son. He reaches for the throne of God to hang man upon his father's mercy. In the next paragraph, Ellen White says, Never had angels listened to such a prayer. And this is the prayer at the baptism. This isn't the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. She said, They were solicitous to bear to the praying Redeemer messages of assurance and love. But notice the response from heaven. It says, But no, the Father himself will minister to his Son. Direct from the throne proceeded the light of the glory of God. There's the glory of God. From the confession of that prayer, the glory of God is shown down upon the Savior. The heavens were opened, and the beams of light and glory proceeded from heaven and assumed the form of a dove in appearance like burnished gold. The dove-like form was representative, was represented, representative of the meekness and gentleness of Christ that he would receive that confirmation that God answered his prayer and that he would give him glory. You notice what's interesting is when in John 17, when Jesus prays, he says, glorify me as I have glorified you on this earth. And his closing prayer. Both prayers dealt with, "Can I, I'm, living, I'm doing this to glorify God with the confession of my lips. When we look a little closer at the word confession, we look to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 to 16. It says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for which such sacrifices God is well pleased, God is glorified. So here it says, give thanks. The word for give thanks is homo logeo or homo lugio. And it's a contraction of two words where we get the word homologous and logos, or the word. So it means speaking the same word in the literal Greek. So, and it's translated in, so the authorized King James Version, the homo logo, uh, logios, is used 24 times in Greek. And of those 24 uses of the word, it's translated to confess or confession 17 times, to make confession, to profess, to promise, and to give thanks one time. The definition of the word, which is written in yellow, it means to say the same thing as another, to agree with someone, to, which is as sent to concede and not to refuse, to promise, not to deny, to de confess, to declare, to confess, or admit one's fault. So if we look at this passage, the, the newer translations translate it as such, therefore let him, therefore through him let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise, that is the fruit of lips that confess his name. And this is what we know is what it means to glorify God. To glorify God means to speak the same thing that God has put inside of us, to make confession of your sin. Sin is not just saying, I'm sorry, which is just the act of the conviction. When you make confession, it's saying, I'm sorry, I know what I did is wrong because your word told me it was wrong and I admit that you are right. It means that you are agreeing with the one who has rebuked you, that you were in the wrong, and it evokes a change in your life. This is what the act is that glorifies God in the first angel's message. In John, we actually, we, we, find, we search this word, homo, homo logio here. It comes up in 1 John chapter 9, uh, 1 John 1 verses 9 and 10. It says, if we confess... Homologio, our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The, the verse 10 there means more now because you know the homologio means to speak the same as God himself. And so if you say you refuse to make confession of your sin, it's saying that you're saying that God said God's word is a lie that I don't have to confess that. And it says that, he says, et make every man a liar. So by refusing to confess your sin, you're saying God is a liar and that you don't need to be forgiven. That's what the Greek is saying. And how could you glorify God if you're calling him a liar? That's what the first angel's message is trying to teach people. To confess your sins means to glorify him. Mrs. White writes in Mount of Blessings, page 114, paragraph 1, Forgiveness has a broader meaning than many suppose. When God gives the promise that he will abundantly pardon, he adds as if the meaning of that promise exceeded all that we could comprehend. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from the condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. David, so she talks about David in the book of Psalms. David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me, Psalms 51.10. And again he says, As far as the east is from the west, so has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalms 113 and verse 12. So David, being a Jew, a Jewish king, he was trained in the Jewish schools, he knew about the sanctuary service. And on the Day of Atonement, the priest would enter from the east gate and walk toward the west where the mercy seat was and apply the blood, correct, on the mercy seat. And at the end of the Day of Atonement, he would walk from the west with that blood and walk all the way out and put it on the head of a scapegoat and send the goat into the horizon of the east until it was into the wilderness. As far as the east is from the west, from the sunrise to the sunset, that sin would be removed from the sanctuary. I lost my screen. So the parsing of the verse in Psalms is a reference to the Day of Atonement when the priest on the Day of Atonement would take the sin out of the sanctuary and put it on the head of the goat and the goat would walk into the east, into the sunset, and it would die in the wilderness. By the hand, it would be led by the hand of the fit man who would carry it into the wilderness. And so he's referencing here in Psalms the work of the high priest on the Day of Atonement that David believes Christ will separate the sin from himself and that he will be cleansed fully from sin and that he will give glory to God. She goes on, the Ministry of Healing, page 181. Many who have been overcome by temptation are humiliated by their failures, but they feel that it is in vain for them to approach unto God, but this thought is of the enemy's suggestion. So when you feel bad about something you did and you're like, well, I'm not going to pray about it yet. I need to go and let it simmer for a little bit before it's time for me to ask for forgiveness. She goes, that is the, by design from the devil. She goes, that thought is from the devil because he doesn't want you to confess your sin. And if he can get you from doing it, he can keep you from stalling from doing it then there's a chance you might not ever confess from it, and then he'll win. He doesn't want that to happen. She goes, when they have sinned and feel that they cannot pray, to them that is that it is then the time to pray the most. Ashamed they may be and deeply humbled, but as they confess their sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive their sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Nothing is apparently more helpless yet really more invincible than the soul that fills its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. I included these in here. I know they're paragraphs, but there's a lot of detail that teaches us about forgiveness, and I think it's important. When we pray for earthly blessings, the answer to our prayer may be delayed, or God may give us something other than we ask. Right? However, 
Not so when we ask for deliverance from sin. It is his will to cleanse us from sin, to make us his children, and to enable us to live a holy life. Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, Galatians 1.4. And this is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us and we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask. We know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him, 1 John 5.14 and 15. The Desire of Ages 266. I like this verse in Proverbs, and this was the, one of the last verses I found about confession, and it says in Proverbs 28 and verse 13, it says, He who conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes his sins will find compassion. So there is a commentary on this verse, and it says, Confession results in experiencing divine compassion here. Divine forgiveness in 1 John 1, 9. Secret sin without open confession leads to personal anguish. Whoa. Secret sin without open confession leads to personal anguish. Before sin entered the world, the only description given of Adam and Eve is in Genesis 2, 25, where it is said that the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. No sin, nothing to hide, no shame. Genuine confession cannot totally recapitulate the sinless state in the Garden of Eden, but can come as close as is possible this side of heaven. Confession of sins, instead of seen as a bad thing, is in fact the best thing for a sinner to practice. Don't miss your opportunity to experience the blessed state of no shame that comes from confessing your sins to God, who faithfully forgives and cleanses. In Psalms 32, when we look at the confession of David after he um, cheated with Bathsheba, it says, And I, David, acknowledge my sin unto you, and my iniquity did I not hide. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. David confesses his sin in essence of three ways here. He acknowledges them. He hides them not, and he confesses them, agreeing with God that he did wrong. Each time with a different Old Testament word for the use of sin, sin, transgression, and iniquity. Note the result is forgiveness of David's guilt. He deserved death, but God gave him, forgave him and allowed him to live. There cannot be a much clearer picture of the totality and completeness of God's forgiveness. The application for believers is to receive his total forgiveness when the confession, when we confess our sins and to move on and not have a pity party and play the tapes over and over again, causing us to relive that sin. Thomas Watson, the famous biblical historian, wrote, The hypocrite doth veil and smother his sin. He doth not absendere peccatum, which is Latin for to cut out the sin. Absendere means to cut out. Peccatum is like pectus, uh, pectorum, which is, which is Latin for chest. So instead of the one who does not cut out his sin from his heart, but abscondir, which means to conceal or cover his sin, is like a patient that has some loathsome disease in his body. He will rather die than confess his disease. But a godly man's sincerity is seen as this. He will confess and shame himself for sin. Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly in 2 Samuel 24 and verse 17. Nay, a child of God will confess sin in particular. An unsound Christian will confess sin by wholesale. Lord, forgive me. <laughs> I can't remember everything I've done, but please just forgive me. It's the wholesale sin forgiveness prayer. Done, sin, forgiven in five seconds. However, he contrasts that with the prayer of David, where David said, as it were, point with his finger at the sore. I have done this evil, Psalms 54, 10, or 51 verse 4. He does not say, I have done evil, but I have done this evil. Forgive me from this. He points to his blood, guiltiness. Thomas Watson. Charles Spurgeon said, pertaining to the prayer and confession of David, the lancet must be let into the gathering ulcer before relief can be afforded. 
The least we, thing we can do if we would be pardoned is to acknowledge our fault. If we are too proud for this, we double deserve punishment. If mine iniquity have I not hid, and mine iniquity have I not hid, we must confess the guilt as, it, as well as the fact of sin. It is useless to conceal it, for it is well known to God. It is beneficial to us to own it, for a full confession softens and humbles the heart. We must, as far as possible, unveil the secrets of the soul, dig up the hidden treasure of Achan, and by weight and measure bring out our sins before God. This ties into the first angel's message because the first angel's message prepares us for the second, which is coming out of Babylon, and prepares us for the third, which is to receive the righteousness of Christ, which then prepares us for translation into heaven. When we talk about the close of probation, the state of the redeemed will not be that of wrestling with the sin itself, but they will be wrestling with the angel as did Jacob at midnight saying, Lord, I will not let thee go except that thou bless me. And Ellen White says that God would have destroyed him in that moment for his resistance had he not first spent hours praying and asking for forgiveness, that he went into the presence of God forgiven and cleansed, that if he went in there with an evil, presumptuous heart fighting with Jesus, he would have been destroyed. He would have been killed. And so that is the sole preparation we go through in the first angel's message that prepares us for the blessing of the third angel's message to have the faith of Jesus that we would not be shaken or fall. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, it says, My little children, these things I have I written unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. It's called the parakletos in Greek. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not only for our, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So let's recap. The first angel's message, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heaven, earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. So far... <clears throat> The only thing that we covered was fear God and give glory to Him. I also, remember I said we have to understand the timing as well as the theology. I didn't cover the timing either. And the timing actually revolves around the saying with a loud voice when the message covers the earth. We will cover that at a later time when we finish the theology of this verse. So next time we study, we will look at the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made the heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of the waters. And then part three of verse seven will be looking at the timing and bearing in Adventist history of how this message evoked a movement that took over the world in our prophetic history. So in summary, what we have studied so far is in verse seven, when it says, fear God and give glory to him, it is says, let the conviction of God in your life lead you to the confession of your sins so that you will acknowledge your sins and repent and by doing so give glory to God and receive pardon for your sins by the perfect sacrifice of his son on the cross and by his intercession for you in the heavenly sanctuary where he has sprinkled his shed blood before the Father's throne over the law as a propitiation for your transgressions, that you may be cleansed. That's what we learned today. Speaking of the thief on the cross, HMS Richards wrote, In the thief of the cross, God gave an example of a man saved in the eleventh hour, so that none might despair. But he gave only one example, so that none might presume. Thank you all for coming today. 